So, just sitting here reading a tea on paper, listening to a vinyl record with my phone away and my laptop as far away from me as possible. Yeah. Getting to new focus grooves. And this piece by John Ganesh, one of my favorite prose stylists at the FT, is kind of relevant to what I was thinking about. The column is called Citizen of Nowhere, generally lives in life and arts in the weekend. Podcasts aren't as smart as you think is the title. And the full quote is, it should be obvious what is going on. People are willing to do almost anything other than read at length. And he also points out how podcasts are sort of human voices. It's like conversational music, he calls it. And they kind of solve our loneliness of you know single occupancy households that are so prevalent these days and they have this patina of intellectualism but they're not the new books any more than hbo series or the new novels he says both ask too little of the audience i wonder about the stickiness of knowledge that you don't have to fight for he says so podcasts are in one ear not the other and he talks about the jovial banter on all these things. I wonder about that. I mean, I feel that way about a lot of podcasts. I think my podcast queue is more intellectual than others, but, you know, probably everybody would say that. And it is true that, you know, sometimes I have to go back and listen twice or I don't retain it as well, especially, you know, if you don't do something active, like take notes. I mean, if you're walking, that maybe gets it into your brain a little bit in some way, but I definitely notice, like, it would be in the right frame of mind to really retain it. Reason reason podcasts aren't the same as books is you don't have to fight for the knowledge and the reason a TV drama isn't the same as the novel is that you can't do the microscopic human observation, which I would agree with. What would you say about audiobooks, right? That's kind of an interesting in between because I listen to a lot of audiobooks as well and I feel like there's a spectrum on both podcasts and audiobooks of seriousness, right? And I feel like the speed at which I can listen to it is almost like an index of that. You know, if it's something quite dense or unfamiliar, I tend to go 1, 1 1.25 at most. If it's something kind of lightweight, two, three X, you know, I just vacuum it up because I'm skimming basically. But, you know, really great fiction too. You got to listen a little bit more slowly to take it in. It just takes longer to like seep into you. It has to almost be at the pace of speaking or it won't work. And is that more passive than reading a book? I guess so. It can be. You have to put yourself in the right frame of mind. Like even like when I'm walking with her and I'm paying attention to, you know, what's she doing? Are there other dogs coming along or whatever? Should have had you in the shop the whole time, Riley. The algorithm loves that. You know, is it, it's maybe not as good of an attentional quality as if I were, you know, just walking by myself with nothing but the book in my ear and ideally, you know, my phone turned off. And that's another thing that's kind of interesting. Like even just here I am recording this video in the midst of a non-physical morning. There's, especially for those of us who are creators, there's this constant pressure to respond to things that we're reading, you know? You have to sit and read the paper, I gotta go record a video about it. And, you know, the same with podcasts, I find myself, you know, books, I'm always pausing and, you know, jot this down or whatever. So maybe that's a form of being more active and fighting for the knowledge or whatever and processing it and, and finding tools that, that break down the sort of the, the pain points for me as a, as a creator user, having to pull my phone out of my pocket, for instance, like I really wish that my watch and my headset, could, I could just say, you know, pause, take a note, and it would transcribe it and put it into my system and I wouldn't have to tap, tap, tap and break the concentration, you know? So I think there's there's room for tools like that. I just found a new one. I haven't decided if I'm going to subscribe yet, but I think it's called Read, Read something, Readscape, Read something, I forget. Anyway, <laughs> really great pitch for this product. So Readwise, I think it's called, I'll link it. But it basically takes all your digital highlights from eBooks and dumps them into some kind of you know, project management system or whatever, which would be great for me. But yeah, like things like that to reduce friction, to allow you to respond, you know, take scribble in the margins, right? Like people always say, I won't give up my books because I can scribble in the margins. I don't scribble in the margins of the newspaper, but you know, there's a sensoriness to it. You know, people used to take clippings out of newspapers, but they would cut out <laughs> little bits of a newspaper, which I've never done, but it's kind of an interesting, it's another one of those like sensory, um, practices where you engage in an embodied way with the media. It's fascinating. Same with, you know, you're going to flip the record, but that's less so, but there's, there's something still tactile about it. It's nice. Do those things enhance concentration or appreciation of the content? I don't know. They can distract in a good way, right? There's like good distraction, a little pause, right? A little breathing. I'm going to go flip the record now. I got to turn the page, you know? It's not just like this totally passive. It's just going to wash over me and I can basically tune out. I have to interact in some way. Say, okay, you know, next. It's, it's like this little, it's like a built-in, you know, like those forms where you have to click next or whatever and it just gives you one question at a time or, or like various ui ux things trying to stop the scroll and get you to like interact you know in e-learning i want to ask this is a big thing like make the user interact 
so they can't just sit back and passively take it in. I mean, that's what Edpuzzle is trying to do, take a YouTube video and put interaction into it, right? Things like that. So anyway, it's, it's just interesting to me balancing all these things. It makes a nice newspaper column, but I don't think ultimately it's about saying this medium or that medium is better or worse, but it's good in this type of thinking because at least it gets us thinking about, okay, how do I consume each type of media? And there's like that metacognitive skill that's kind of hard when you've got the UI UX designers are, are busy trying to make it as frictionless as possible, and that's ad efficiency, right? What Nassim Taleb would call overly efficient, over-optimized, and that's fragile, right? It's so efficient that it's kind of Teflon, right? It doesn't stick. There's no, there's not enough resistance, you know, like an artificial playground with no natural volatility and variability, right? And the child can't, you know, they lose their balance and proprioception if they only play on those things. They need resistance from the world to engage with something. Anyway, I think that's about all my thoughts on that. Check out Janan Ganesh, Citizen of Nowhere. Let me know in the comments what you do to be more conscious about your media intake and how you relate to different formats.